Well, good evening, Father's Art. I'm so excited to be with you. I trust that you are ready for an awesome, awesome time as we come around God's Word. And we are going to see and hear what God has for us tonight in Jesus' name. So let's just pray as we come online. Father, I pray right now that you're going to move by your Spirit in a mighty way. Lord, I thank you for your plan, purpose, destiny that you have for each one of us. Lord, I thank you that as we come around your Word tonight, Lord, that you're going to flow by your Spirit in a mighty way. Lord, I thank you for a spirit of revelation, a spirit of insight. And Lord, I pray an understanding to flow, Lord, and that we will not be the same again. Holy Spirit, you are so welcome. And Lord, I thank you that you are moving in our lives. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. Well, folks, this time of the year, things are going very, very hectic with everybody, including us. And so uh, I've given John and them off, uh, the team off tonight, because I really want them to focus on some other things. And so right now, I want to get right into our teaching. I want to deal with our offering teaching tonight. In Acts chapter 10, verse 2, we read the following. A devout man, all right, this is talking about Cornelius. And Cornelius was a Gentile. He wasn't even a Jew. Okay, he wasn't allowed to really do the things that he did. But because of what he did, God moved and changed the laws and made it so that Gentiles could get saved because of what Cornelius did. But this is what he did. It says this, a devout man, one who feared God with all of his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. Now, I wanted to say that those things, those three things started to build a massive monument before God that God could not ignore him. In fact, to the point that it changed the rules. Now, I wanted to say this. We as believers need to be consistent in what we do. Okay, this is something that Cornelius did always. The Bible says, and he prayed to God always. All right, this is something that did not just come when he needed something or when there was a hype or when he was under crisis. You know, it's amazing when we're in crisis, we pray so quickly and we quickly get stuck in and say, God, help us, please get us through this or whatever. I want to say this. We need to be consistent even when it's going well. When you actually don't need anything from the Lord, I'm talking about your natural needs. When things are just working out and things are just flowing. I want you to know, do not slack on what you mean to do. Okay, so three major, major things happened here with him. Number one is, is that he served God, he feared God. All right, he had a respect for God. In other words, he tried to obey the word of the Lord. Secondly, he gave generously to the, to the people. He was a giver. In any situation, wherever he could, he gave. The Bible says that he gave alms to the poor. He gave wherever he could. Okay, and then thirdly, he was consistent in his prayer life. And so when you are consistent in these things, I fear God, I am a giver, and I pray. I want you to know that there is going to be a fruit that's going to come on your life that is going to bless you immensely. Now, I want to say this. As we come around the offering time, whenever we give, we give in faith. We believe God, we trust God, and we do what God has called us to do. His word is very clear. We give tithes and offerings to our local church. Okay. And then we can help others around us. Wherever there's a need, we can help and assist that we must be ready for that. If, and there are many of our father's heart members that do this and say, listen, I don't get time to actually get to the poor and honestly get to the poor. So then what we have said is give it to the church. We will make sure that it gets to those who are in need. Okay, so if you want to give to the poor, that's what arms mean. Cornelius used to give to the poor. And so what happens is if you can't get there, we make sure we give to the poor. We make sure that as a church, we actually get it to where it's needed. And to make sure that those families are taken care of. So I want you to know that there are many people um, who are now deciding that it's easier for them. Because one of the things that we do do is make sure that it's the right people who get it, okay? Because some people can be uh, quite, um, uh, quite, um, what's the word, uh, divisive, and they're lying, and they say they do this, but it's not the truth. Okay, we've got to make sure of that, and we trust God for that. But the point is this, is we need to be givers, and we need to be consistent in what we do. So let's just pray. And just before I pray, I want to just say this. You see, if you are giving from outside of the nation, 
I want you please just to go to fathersheart.co.za and please hit the donate button. The figures in rands and that is the quickest and the easiest way that you could donate um, to Father's Heart. Amen. All right. Let's pray together. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I thank you for what you're doing for each and every believer in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you that as we give, and Lord, that we are trusting you, and you are our source, and you are our only source. Father, I thank you that we will be consistent in these things. Lord, we'll be consistent givers. We'll be consistent in fearing you. And Lord, we'll be consistent in praying. Lord, I thank you right now that you are leading us, guiding us, directing us by your Spirit. And Father, I thank you, Lord, that as we give, Lord, your biblical principles apply. And Lord, that faith is operating in our lives. Lord, we speak life over our finances. We give life over our offerings. Father, I thank you, Lord, that every single person that we give to the poor, Lord, that your word says that we are lending to you and you will repay us in this life. Father, I thank you, Lord, for these promises that are activated right now. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. Amen, folks. I want to just say to you, it's such an honor and a privilege to be part of Father's Heart and uh, to be able to sit down and serve you and to do what we need to do. All right. I want to remind you and just so that you know that I am personally praying for you. OK, and I really do lift you up before the Lord that God will do something supernatural for each individual, for each family in Jesus name. Amen. All right. I want to get into tonight's teaching. And tonight I want to deal with the topic of the three weapons in worship. Three weapons in worship. Now, I want to just say this before we even get into this. I want to just say that, you know, Christianity is the only religion that has worship as part of their religion. Okay. The other religions don't have worship. They don't have this time where they worship the Lord and they honor the Lord. Now, you can worship the Lord any way that you want. In other words, you could sit down and have it on a TV. You could play YouTube uh, videos. Um, you could sit down and, and have it on, on a voice note. And, you know, like we do with our worship, you can watch it on Facebook. It doesn't matter where, how you do it. But the point is this, is why do we even have worship in our, in our religion? Why is worship so significant? Why is it so important? You know, why is it that we don't just do like the Jewish culture where we just get together and we just get straight into the word and then we just leave and we pray? Okay, because we are the only religion, Christianity is the only religion that has worship as its center focus and a key major point. And so I'm going to explain to you why that, that is and why we, um, we operate in worship and use it as a weapon. Okay, so let me tell you why. Because God has instituted that when we come and we lift him up and we focus on him, there is certain spiritual laws that get released, certain things that start happening. Okay. Now, I want to make this very clear. Worship is not just when I go to a church and somebody just singing there. Okay. It can be any way that you can. You can be worshiping God in your car on the way to work. Okay. But when we deal with some of these weapons, please don't apply them while you are driving a car. All right. So let's go through some of them. I want to say that in the worship, God's given us some elements that we can use as weapons. So our first element that I want to deal with is clapping of hands. You know, we clap. Now, I find this very, very interesting how that so many people find it so difficult to clap in church, but yet it's quite okay to clap and scream and carry on when our rugby team is getting over the try line. You know, I sit down and I... I was in a situation once and I really, this amused me. I was on a Saturday in, in Pretoria. I was in laughters. Man, the crowd was screaming and going absolutely moggy and absolutely wild. I went to a church um, on that Sunday and it was a Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening service. <coughs> Sorry. And it was packed. Okay. And there was probably about 3000 people there. And the worship was amazing. It was really going. But what amazed me was that I sat amongst 3,000 people and not one person clapped in the whole church. And yet the, the music was really upbeat, up-tempo, you know, and it was very easy to clap. And I found it amazing how that just the day before, the public can just go screaming, clapping, and going mad, and then coming to a church environment and say we're all conservative and quiet. 
Now, I think that that is one of the, wep- uh, the tricks that the devil has got to try and keep us away from our weapons. I believe that Satan is trying to stop us from using what is ours. Clapping is actually a weapon. How many of you have ever been taught that? How many knew that? Clapping in church is actually a weapon. All right, let's go. And I want you to go and look at the definition, the Hebrew definition of the word clap. All right. It means to thrust, to drive in as used as a weapon. It's like if I take a knife and I pierce you with it and I thrust it into you and I drive it into you. The sound of clapping is like an arrow that's coming into you. And the Bible says that we are supposed to be clapping in our worship. And when we clap, we are releasing a weapon against the enemy. All right. Another definition is to give a blast, to give a blow. In other words, to give a punch. So how do I punch somebody when I clap? Because there's something in the spirit that gets released when you clap. All right. It means to strike. When you clap hands and you're going, I'm not hitting somebody. It's not a clap when I hit them. It's a clap here when I put my hands together and it's creating a punch against somebody or something. And so it means to pledge to oneself. So I thought, this is quite interesting. We think clapping is just making a noise. No, it's not. It is actually delivering blows of attack into the territory of the enemy. It's there to release blows, things in the spirit, into the enemy's camp. And yet, we are too shy to practice this in church. Well, Nick, can I ask you a favor? Don't do it in church then. Do it at home. Put on a praise and worship uh, thing and start clapping with the worship. I believe that this is a weapon that we can use as the body of Christ to release blows into the spirit realm that we have not anywhere practiced or got used to. And yet the Bible is very clear that we need to be doing this. All right. So I want to show you some claps that we used in the word of God, some claps that we used in the Bible for specific actions. The first one was used by the prophets. Ezekiel 21.14. Now Ezekiel is busy prophesying against uh, Israel. He's actually coming against Israel. All right, now they're rebelling and God is going to sort them out and God's going to do this. But he says to, to, um, to Ezekiel, prophesy this, warn them that it's coming because it's me that's bringing it. Not the devil, nobody else. It's me. I'm coming against them because they are being um, rebellious again. So this is verse 14. It says this. You therefore, son of man, prophesy. Strike your hands together. In other words, clap. Listen to this. The third time, let the sword do double damage. All right. It is the sword that slays, the sword that slays the great men that enters their private chambers. So what is he saying? He says, when you clap, on the third time, a sword is going to be released. It's very interesting. Because God says it's going to be the sword that's going to go into the private chambers. In other words, into the hidden places. Now, what does that mean in practice? Remember that the sword is the word of God. And so, yeah, Ezekiel was going to clap and he claps three times. On the third time, judgment was coming to Israel because it had been spoken. God had spoken it as a sword. But I want you to understand the power of this prophetic action. All that Ezekiel was doing was clapping his hands. He did nothing else. And a sword was released and judgment came onto Israel because literally it clapped three times. Now, I want to say this. When God says that when you clap, it is like a strike. It is a thrust. It drives something in. It is something that happens in the demonic world that gets shifted and changed. Now, we don't always know what that is that we are fighting against. We don't know what principality or power, whatever it is, is coming into our area or domain. But when we clap, it breaks something. It cuts something off. It changes something. 
So saints, I want to encourage you every single time you get into worship, use your clapping as a weapon. Do not just think of it, oh, it's a nice tune, let's clap along. No, you've got to understand, you are now going into warfare in your worship. And this is very significant, and it's really important that we practice this. Amen? And then, the second group are, uh, are the saints. We are supposed to be clapping. We've been given instruction to clap when we worship. In Psalm 47 verse 1, it says this, Oh, clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. Oh, clap your hands, all you peoples. It's not that you can stand there and not clap and enter into worship. Now, I want to just say this, and I want to just give honor where honor is due and credit where credit is due. My senior pastor's wife, her name was Pastor Mariana. Mariana Crompton used to, we used to, I remember sitting in the church and we, there was these galleries on the side. You know, they just built these galleries and all the young people, and we were all young, I'm talking about, you know, 10 to 13 years old, the young guys, okay? Sitting on the side, we, we take up the gallery seats. And let me tell you something, let her catch us not clapping. Let her catch us because she would be at the bottom and she'd look on the side and she'd catch us on the front, from the front row. And she would start rebuking us from her pew. And she would tell us, listen, you better get into worship. If we sat down during worship, heaven help you. She would come to us and rebuke us and say, this is not how you worship. Now she had an understanding or an insight on the power of worship. That when we worship God, we give God the glory and we use the weapons that we are meant to do. And when the Bible says that all of us clap, he's literally saying all of us. All right, this is not an option where you sit down and go, oh, well, I don't feel like clapping or I'm conservative. Let me tell you something. Conservativeness is part of the devil's trick to keep us away from our weapons. And I know that you might find it a bit um, uncomfortable to begin with. That's why I said practice at home. Get yourself used to this. All right. These are instructions that God has given us. And I'm sure you want to use the weapons that have been given at your disposal. All right. The third group that clap, and you're going to be surprised at this, are the rivers. Psalm 98 verse 8. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord. You see, this is going to be something, and we don't understand how that nature can also do these things. Now, just because you don't see it does not mean that it's not true. If it's in the Word of God, it's quite possible that it is true. The fourth group that, you, that clap their hands are the trees. Isaiah 55, 12. It says this, For you shall guard with joy and be led with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth with singing before you, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. The trees of the field. I want you to understand that only nature and Christians are instructed to clap their hands. Only Christians and nature are instructed to clap their hands. Not the unsaved, not anybody else. And so I need you to understand this is a very important weapon. I believe that if the sons of God, the believers are not doing it, that nature then steps in. It's exactly the same. It says, if you will not praise me, the stones will cry out and praise me. Did not say they're doing it all the time and they're not doing it immediately. But I want to say this. Nature will bring about what needs to happen on this earth if you don't. And so we need to take our roles. And we need to obey the word and do what God has called us to do. So saints, I want to encourage you. Not one of us are exempt from clapping when we worship. And I know that's uncomfortable. I know that that goes against some of our teaching, some of our training, some of our schooling. But it's biblical. All right. So even if you clap quietly or gently, it's fine. But the point is we need to get this as part of a practice in our worship. Number two. Is stomping our feet. What? Well, let's go back where the prophets used it. In, in Ezekiel 25, 20, uh, verse 6. Ezekiel 25, verse 6. says, Thus says the Lord God, Because you clapped your hands. Now listen, 
He had given Ezekiel his prophecy. And he says, because you clapped your hands and because you stomped your feet and rejoiced in your heart with all this dying for the land of Israel. And he carries on. He says, I will now take action. So he said to the prophet, listen, you clap your hands and you stomp your feet. And when you stomp your feet, it's going to do stuff in the spirit world. Now, when you stomp your feet, it is the same as when you dance before the Lord. Right? You're physically using your feet before the Lord. Okay? And so I want you to see the first group that did it was prophets. They would do a prophetic action with this. And it's really interesting to see. We do it as a prophetic action. Why would I do it as a prophetic action? Because in Luke chapter 10 verse 19 it says, Behold, I have given you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. You are there to trample on them. You are supposed to have your feet on top of them. And so when you dance in church, and when you jump around in church, you are prophetically going into a warfare mode, especially when you clap and dance. And so there's a warfare spirit that gets released and God starts fighting on behalf of you when you do this. Now, the third group is the believers. Okay? The third time that you do it. So it's, uh, prophets do it. You can do it as a prophetic action. And now we are instructed to dance. In Psalm 149 verse 3 it says there, Let them praise His name with the dance. Let them sing praises to Him with timbrels and harps. In other words, He's speaking to the body of Christ. The nation. And he says, come, you need to dance, you need to sing, you need to clap. Those are three very distinctive things that we are told to do. Okay? And so when we dance, we are doing prophetic action of stomping on demonic forces. When you clap, you are releasing the blows as you go. So a lot of people just take worship as just singing like a song, a secular song that we just sing along with. No, it's far, far more than that. <clears throat> and then number three, it's clapping, it's stomping or dancing. Number three, it's our voices, our voices. All right. Now, when you speak or when you shout, there is an authority that goes with it, even though you don't realize it. Now, we've thought so many times, and I'm sure everybody knows, everything happens with a voice, a word, instruction, comes out of your mouth, something comes out of your mouth, creates and, and, and destructs or destroys or restricts, whatever it is, because of words, it comes out of your, your mouth. Now, I want you to see what happened in Joshua chapter 6, we know the story. They marched around Jericho, and this is now the seventh time. Joshua 6.20. So the people shouted when the priest, priest blew the trumpets. And it happened when the people had uh, heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people started to shout with a great shout, that the walls fell down flat. Okay, and the people went into the city, everyone straight before him, and they took the city. In other words, as the walls fell, you went straight out in front of you. Now, no wall is going to fall when somebody shouts. What happened in the situation? When they used their voices, the power of God started to move. God brought those walls down, not a shout. You can go try and shout at your wall and see how far you get. All right? But God brought those walls down. When we shout and when we praise, Things move in the spirit world. Okay? I want to show you how singing releases God to move. There was another story of Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat was, was being, they were about to come and take out Israel. And God said to Jehoshaphat, get the praise and worship team. We're going to go sort this thing out with praise and worship. And he gets a worship team and he sends them out in front of the warriors. And they start worshiping. Look what happens. Second Chronicles 20, 22. And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord sent ambushes amongst the people of Ammon, Moab, Mount Sire, who had come against Judah, and they were all defeated. 
The Lord set the ambushes when they were praising. What happens when we praise? What happens when we sing? What happens when we do this? God starts moving. It is a weapon of note. Now we are instructed to do this. Psalm 9 verse 11. You are instructed to sing. Sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Declares deeds among the people. Now a lot of people say, well this is Old Testament. Let me get to the New Testament. Right? Ephesians 5.19 speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. It's an instruction to worship. Colossians 3.16 Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Singing again. James 3.15 if any one of you suffer, let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. We are instructed by God to sing. So let's sum this up. We are instructed to clap. It's going to deliver a spear. It's going to deliver a thrust into the enemy's camp. We are instructed to dance and to stomp. It is there to show that we are over the demonic things. It's a demonic uh, it's a prophetic action to show the demonic. We carry the authority. We were instructed to sing and to shout. When you do that, God moves. So I want you to understand that when it comes to worship, you don't have a choice. You cannot stand still. You cannot be silent. You need to be involved and you need to be active because this is part of your warfare. Worship is one of the strongest keys in warfare. And we need to understand that. That's why. Like in Halloween, we sit down and say, listen, we are not going to pray over the Halloween day. We are going to praise. We are going to bring worship and we are going to praise. And when we do that, God starts moving. So I want you to understand, we are going to use praise more and more. So that people understand the power of praise when the saints get together. So let's pray. Lord, I ask you right now to forgive us, Lord, for we, we have held back in our weaponry. But Lord, I thank you that as we move forward, Lord, that we will start using our weapons in worship. And Lord, that as we come and we praise and we clap, and Lord, and we dance, I thank you that we will see the power of God move in our lives. And Lord, that you will do something supernatural for each one of us. Father, we thank you for a supernatural move of your spirit in every single person's life. Lord, I seal each and every family tonight in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, that even though there might be some uncertainty in our land right now, that there is peace. There is peace in our hearts. And Lord, we know that you are in control. We worship you, we honor you, and we thank you, Lord, for bringing us to maturity. Thank you, Lord, for letting us grow up in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. Well, saints, I want to bless you. I want to say go and have a wonderful evening. Amen. As you go and do what God has called you to do. Remember that from next week, you are praising God in everything that you do. Amen and amen. Well, God bless you. Remember, I'm back with communion tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Straight after that, I will be doing a live feed uh, for praying for our nation. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Amen and amen.